talking about worship. <clears throat> Several, the last couple weeks we talked about worship, we'll do it. Uh, we have one more extension, um, uh, one more installment of this coming up next week, or maybe even two more, it depends on how it goes. But <clears throat> it's this, this thing of worship. Worship is it's so vital, but yet I think it's so uh, misunderstood. And last week we tried to give a definition, tried to give some understanding of what worship is. And we know that um, the psalm, the book of psalms, is filled with worship prose and poems and, and hymns and calls. It, it, causes us, it causes us to worship. And, and some of you all looked at me a little bit suspicious last week when I talked about uh, only Christians can worship. It's interesting because uh, one of the students, one of our young adults in the young adult Bible study on Wednesday asked a question, it, um, can you praise without worshiping? And can you worship without praising? Which is a fascinating question. And uh, I don't know if we got to the root of it, but um, sincere praise will lead you into worship if you are um, connected with uh, God in the spirit. Amen. Um, and and worship, worshiping God um, for who God is. Um, there, you can't help but to give some praise. Amen. Amen. Um, <clears throat> and and so I want to give us a couple things, just a couple things, and then I want to kind of walk through this text a little bit. And you all stay with me. I've I've had a chance to kind of think about this a little bit, <clears throat> and let's see what what happens here. Um, worship, worship is the process of ascribing worthiness or worth to something. I want you to know that we were designed to worship. We were made to worship. That there is a human um, uh, desire, regardless of your religious affiliation or not, to worship. Uh, when you go and do research and you do the history of, of mankind all the way to the beginning of time, we desired and always sought something to worship. And so Jesus is having a conversation in, in, in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well, and he talks about various things. He says this great line, he says, there comes a time where we won't worry about where we worship, but we'll worship God who is spirit. We'll worship him in spirit and in truth, in spirit and in truth. And, and just kind of out a nutshell, um, when we worship God in spirit, and in truth, we worship God in spirit and in truth. It is a spiritual exercise, and you can't have a spiritual exercise without being changed and transformed and blessed. Are you with me? And it's the truth of it. And so when we worship God in spirit and truth, there's at least three things that has to be it to account for. One is we have to account for the person of God. <laughs> God the person. We also have to account for uh, the promises of God. Are you all with me on that? It's not just, it's not just um, um, the, uh, the person, but it's also God's promises. And then the proper priority. Are you all with me on that? When we talk about worship, it's, it's the intersection between who God is, the person of God. Um, um, the promise of God, who God said, what God says, his word. And the priority we put God in our lives. Are you all with me on that? And, and, and so let me just give you a few things real quick, and I, and I, and I promise you I'll, I'll get us out of here. And so worship is an external reaction to an internal reality. What we do externally, watch this, is indicative of what we believe on the inside. Boy, I'm not getting no help up in here today. That's all right. Um, uh, and it's the truth. And in, in, in Psalm 119, verse 6, it says, the sum of your word is truth. Amen. And so there are three things I want to give you real quick, and then I want to get into this text, and then we'll get out of here. Worship, the, worship is, is the worshiper getting to know God. Listen, listen, listen. You cannot worship that which you do not know. You can't ascribe worth and worthiness and value to something you don't know. And so worship, in worship, it is a process of getting to know God for who God is, the person of God. It's an intimate connection with God. Are you with me? Two, it is also a release. I love this. 
Uh, worship is about being released. Y'all didn't get it. Worship is about being released of what we think worship is. Yes. That God is spirit. And so therefore, God cannot be contained in one place. Right. That God is everywhere and, and, all, and, and at all times. And so therefore, anywhere we are, we can experience God's intimacy with God and the presence of God. And therefore, we can have a worship experience wherever we are. And I need you to understand that we, we got to release ourselves from limiting to how and where we can worship. We worship God with our voice. Yes, that's acceptable. The Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. We worship with our voice. Sing unto the Lord a new song. We worship God with our voice. And we also lift up our hands and we wave. And, you know, we got all the different things. We got the multiple ways in which we uh, worship God. We, we got the, um, the stadium wave where we wave like this. Like we're in the stadium, come on, somebody. We got the, uh, the parade float wave. We got the, um, the uh, 24 hour fitness wave. Yeah, so we can wave and we can worship God, but, but that's not the only way. David worshiped God with his mouth. David worshiped with his hand. David worshiped in dance, but sometimes David didn't do anything but sit down and just meditate on the beauty of who God is. We worship God in different ways. I remember I tell the story, my wife remembers this. So we lived in Atlanta for a while, and you all know I'm a diehard Lakers fan, and, and, and we had a chance to go see the Lakers play the Atlanta Hawks. And, 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 and you remember this, baby? We, went, we were there, and I paid a little extra to get good seats, and and we were there watching um, the Lakers, and, and they were giving it to the Hawks. And, and then the Hawks started coming back. And then and it's kind of a side note, uh, uh, we were sitting right next to Robert Ory's family, didn't even know it. And Robert Ory missed a shot, and, 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 and I'm like, I started yelling at Robert, and his mom turned around and said, don't you talk about my baby? I said, you don't even know him. She put her, her, her ID, said, this is my son. I said, oh, my goodness. Well, tell your son he can shoot better. <laughs> We're the only Laker fans up in the place. And anyway, Kobe makes this incredible shot. And I'm acting a fool. He made this shot. Ah, stepping all over. Ah, ah, ah. And Tanisha. Yeah. I'm like, did you see that? She goes, yes, I did. Well, you want to get up? And she said, ah, it was good. And I was all, I'm all, I had an attitude. I'm like, I done spent all this money. You going to sit there like nothing happened? <laughs> you need to do the Shabak or something up in there. And, 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 and so four days later, four days later, we're at home, you know, and she's on the phone, and she's talking, and she's saying, you know, we went to the game the other day, and Kobe made this shot. She said, it was so incredible. She said, I was speechless. I couldn't even move. It was so beautiful. And it hit me, huh, everybody don't worship the same way. In other words, don't you judge folks. We got to release folks. Sometimes we shout and we scream and we, and we yell praises to God and others. We sit in reverential awe of the beauty of who God is and how God is moving. Don't you dare judge nobody on how they worship and how they praise God. Come on, somebody. I should get an amen up in it. So, 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 so we have, uh, worship allows us to be free to worship him anyway. And I need you to understand that this is incredible. That, that when, we are, um, when we are living out our God-given talents, we are worshiping. Those who coach kids. If that's your God given talent, you are worshiping. Those who counsel, those who teach, those who clean toilets, those who work with numbers, whatever your gift is, when you are doing it and how God has uniquely wired you, you express that thing in the world, you are worshiping. You can experience God in the sanctuary. You can experience him in the restroom. You can experience him in the courtroom. You can experience him in the boardroom. There is no limitations. Wherever God is and whenever we're living out our creative um, excel our creative expression we are worshiping God are you all with me Amen. and it begins to overflow with love and joy and hope and trust and dependence upon him last thing I want to tell you is that 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 worship true worship not only seeks to know God 
True worship not only seeks to move beyond the limitations and the barriers that we have, but true worship it, um, also allows us, it also allows us not to be distracted. Hmm. Let me see if, I can, if it makes sense to you. Not to be distracted. Listen, listen, listen. True worship, just highlighting from last week, true worship allows us not to be distracted because God, remember I told you it's about the person of God, knowing him. It's about the promises of God, right? And it's about, and it's, and it's about um, um, knowing that, 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 that God is our priority, that we can't be distracted. If we come into church, we come into the worship experience, and our minds are someplace else, that means that we have given that the position in our minds and our hearts of God. And God says, I am a jealous God. I will not share my worship with anyone else. I must be priority. I must be the final authority. I must be in the proper position. And, and it's interesting because I told you all last week, and then I'll move on to this week. I told you all last week, my wife is that way. She's like, uh, when I have you, when it's my time, I'm not sharing it with nobody else. You didn't get it. God says, when it's time for you to worship me, when you are giving me what is due me, I don't want to share you with nobody else. Come on, somebody. Are you all with me? Because we recognize that God is powerful, that God is lovely, and God is beautiful, and God is holy, and God is not going to take second position. We know that God knows all things, and yet, and still, he desires to have a relationship. That begs to ask a question. Here's, here's where we go for the day. Have you ever felt like if God is all that, he knows all that, God is, is perfect, and God is spirit, have you ever thought that maybe God don't have nothing to do with you? Why would a wonderful, majestic, powerful, holy, royal God want to deal with me? Anybody other than me ever thought that? Ain't none of y'all ever thought that? I just thought y'all honest. And then, and then I would say, well, I'm just talking about me. Because, um, Charlene, I can't speak for nobody else, but here's the thing that's interesting. What kind of person is God looking for to worship him, to come to him? Let me show you the kind of person he's looking for. Y'all ready? Luke chapter 7, verse 36. What version is that version up there? Is that the King James? Y'all got uh, something other than the King? I'm going to read from, read some, King James. Uh, King. I'm going to read this version. I like this. Listen to this. I'm reading from the New King James. Uh, the NIV is similar. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. Walk with me for a moment. When you get it, say Amen. Only three people said amen. What version is that one? That's NIV? Okay, we can rock with NIV. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Keep going. When a woman who had lived a sinful life in the town learned that Jesus, she learned, uh, my version says, knew that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume, verse 38. And as, as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her what? Then she wiped them with her what? Kissed them and poured perfume on them. Verse 39. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to what? He said to what? He said to who? He said to himself. He said to himself, if, th if this man were truly, I added the word truly, if he was truly a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. That she is a what? Verse, 30, uh, verse 40. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me 
teacher, he said, stop. Isn't it interesting? There's two things that happened in this text that I thought was very, very interesting. The first thing that's happening in this text is that he said to himself. And then Jesus responded by answering him, and he didn't even say nothing. Turn to your neighbor. I can look at your face and see what you're thinking. Come on, somebody. But the other thing is, it, the text says, uh, the Pharisee who invited him to Pharisee's house, the Pharisee, and Jesus turned around and called him by name. Why did he call him by name? Because there were other people in the house, and Jesus wanted him to know that I know what you're thinking. Let's keep going. Two, he tells this story. He says, two men owed, uh, uh, owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, and the other owed him 50 denarii. Keep going. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he canceled the debt of both of these men. Now, which of them will love him more? Verse 42. Simon replied, I suppose the one who has, I suppose, I suppose, I guess, I guess the one who has the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Verse 44. Then he turned towards the woman and said to her, do you see uh, this woman? I came into your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she um, wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Verse 45. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time she entered into your house, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many what? Her many what? Her many what? Have been what? For she has loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. Hmm. I'll stop there. Gracious and wonderful God, speak to your, your servants. Let us hear from you on high. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our strength, our redeemer, and our friend. So what kind of person is God looking for? What kind of person is the kind of person that can approach God and worship? Write this down. One who is a sinner. It's interesting, Kim, because what is fascinating to me about this particular text is that uh, I read this text. It was 3.30 in the morning. I read this text. This is the honest good of the truth. I read this text at 3.30 this morning. I was reading it. And the first time I read it, I was kind of distracted. I was still trying. It was still early. I was still trying to get my mind focused. I was thinking about some other stuff. But on that second time I read that text, as I was reading through it, Amy, I just started crying. Tears just came down my face. I didn't cry on the inside. I cried externally. I couldn't help it. I was hoping that no one would see me. And nobody had no business up at 3.30 but me. But I was hoping that no one would see me. I was just crying. And I couldn't stop. And I cried for several reasons. And I want to just share a few of those reasons with you. The, one of the reasons that I, I began to cry is because it seems to me that the organization, the entity, the organism that I love and I work for, the church, has gotten it wrong on so many occasions. Lord, please. This woman was a public sinner. And yet, she was drawn to Jesus. But yet, the one who seemed like they knew better was trying to push her away. You didn't get it. I told you it's about the person that when you know God for who God is, you are drawn to God. I had a conversation. I had a conversation um, um, uh, several years ago with a with a young man who says that you know it's hard for me to connect with my wife. It's hard for me to connect with her intimately because she knows so much about me, and and, and no one knows that. And I feel so vulnerable around it. I, it it's so it's so difficult. And and he says because she knows all my faults. And it's interesting how when people know us, know our stuff, we sometimes want to run away. But the beauty of God is that when God knows our stuff, and we know he knows our stuff, and we know who he is, it doesn't push us away. It draws us to him. 
Draw me nearer. Nearer. The Bible, the Bible talks about a God who wants to be intimate with us. And it even says, as I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. But yet the religious aristocracy, the religious zealots, the religious rule keepers always are looking for ways to keep people away from God. And God is constantly saying, come unto me. All who are weary and heavy laden. I was heavy hearted because the organization that I love, the organism that I, that, I, that I fight for, the gospel that I preach to, the people I preach to, oftentimes we get it confused. We stand with the Pharisees of trying to keep them out versus standing with the sinner who's trying to get in. God is trying to draw us in, not keep us out. We serve a God who knows us in the intimacy of our mess. And yet, he says, come. I want you to think about it for a moment. Isn't that good news? That he's not trying to keep us away. Let's bring folks in and not keep people away. Amen? Amen. And it's interesting, it's interesting, because she recognized that he was, that she knew, it says that once she knew he was there and knew what he was doing, she had the courage to move beyond all the mess to connect with God. Let me talk to you for a moment. This is interesting. This is very, very powerful, because what, what happens here is that they never said what her sin was, but they said she had many, and everybody knew it. I'm coming over here because y'all didn't get it. Her sin was a public sin. And guess what her sin was? This is Mary, Mary Magdalene. She was believed to have been a, a prostitute. Watch this. And, and he says, if he was a real prophet, my word real, he would not let this woman touch him. But yet still, she was so drawn by the power of who God is that she broke every cultural rule of the time. She was a woman, so God is looking for women. Come on, somebody, to come close to him. Yes, women, y'all need to say me too in the church because if God can use a woman, he can use, come on, somebody, me too. I ain't got no help. I only got a piece of a help. Uh, I'm just telling you, that's the text. And, and, and not only was, did she not have no business in somebody else's house, uninvited, the person she was, but she not only was invited, but she came and did what was supposed to be done for him by the host. And she had enough courage not to let anyone stop her let me tell you something, how powerful this is. Is that God is not only looking for second-class citizens to come and be with him, but he's also looking for those who have been broken. If she was a woman of the evening, imagine all the acts that she must have performed and how she had to detach her mind and her heart and even her spirit from her actions. That everybody knew her stuff. I always... I always want to ask the question, how did the Pharisee know what she did? I'm going to sit there for a minute and let y'all think about that. How he know? How he know? And how he know her sins were many? And so, and so, and so, and so, she boldly comes to God, and she sees him for who he is, and she recognizes that he's the real deal, and she begins to do something that was incredible to me. She began to pour perfume or, or, or ointment on his feet. Now, Gary reminded me about this ointment. Gary McKinney reminded me about this ointment. This ointment 
was the ointment that she used to attract men because it was, come on somebody, to enhance her profession. To cover up the stench of the act she had just performed with someone else. And the very thing that she used to enhance her sin, she now is pointed on the feet in worship to God. And the reason she was pointed on his feet is because she had surrendered her own life. Because once you have an encounter with God for who God is, you can't go back to your sinful ways. And she poured, come on somebody, the very thing that she used to attract sin, she now has put it on the feet of God. And she didn't need it anymore. Come on, somebody. And then she goes off, and she does wonderful things in the life of the church. I'm going to give you just a little bit more, and I'm going to get us out of here. She goes on to do wonderful things in the life of the church. She sits at the feet of Jesus when he was crucified. She was one of the women who was there when he was resurrected. And she goes on to become a saint in the church for all the work that she did. She was a person. And I want you to understand something. If you read the first three verses of chapter 8, it talks about a couple women who had helped finance the ministry of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody. And she was one of them. She wasn't broke financially, but she was broke in her spirit. She was broke in her heart, and she was broke in her mind. And I want you to understand that when you come to God and you give your whole self, God restores your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. I don't want you coming here playing church. We serve a Savior who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we could ever hope, think, or imagine. I'm amazed at what God has been able to do. He turned a marriage, come on somebody, into someone who has become an apostle of hope and blessing. What are you holding on to that God wants to take from you? What do you need to pour on his feet so that God can use you to do great things for his kingdom? Can I ask you one more thing? Because I think this is just wonderful. This is just this kind of wonderful thing that happens here. He's looking for it. Folks who are willing to be honest about what you're struggling with so that he can use you for his glory. That's not good news for you. And what I want to tell you, Brother Fisher, is that it's about the person of God. When you know who the person of God is and you know him for yourself, you can't help but to worship him. When I, when, 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 when I realize that he knows my stuff, I can't help but to worship him. That's the person of God. And then you want to make God a top priority, but I get stuck on his promises. Listen, his promises says, whatever God promises, it says something about who God is. But it also says something about what he feels about you. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? If God makes a promise to you, God, it says something about him, the promise that he makes. But it also says how he feels about you. You didn't get it. Let me see if it makes sense. Hello, how are you? I promise I'm going to knock you out. (laughs) I promise I don't like you. That says something about my heart of anger, and it says how I feel about her. But if I see you and I say, my promise is nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. That says something about my heart, but it says something about how I feel about her. Come on, somebody. If, 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 if God is speaking to me and God's promises says something, God says all things work together for the good for those who love the Lord, who are called according to my purposes. It says something about the God. But it also says how I feel about you. It says that no matter what you go through, Lonnie, I'm going to turn that thing around for your good. Right? The promise is my father is rich. Come on, somebody. And will supply all my needs according to 
his riches, it means that God, it says that he's rich, and it also says that he wants to share his riches with you. It means that if God, listen, if God is rich and he's going to supply my needs, it means that he's going to invest in you. Because rich folks don't just give their resources to folks who ain't got a plan and a purpose for their life. If God is going to pour in you, that means he got a plan and a purpose for your life. He promised you something, and he's going to, you ain't get it. If God says that, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. It says even in the darkest hour, the God that you serve is faithful. And guess what? He's going to protect you in dark spaces. Are you all with me on that? It's, oh, man, y'all not getting this thing. This is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. And, 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 and that's what I want you to understand, that if you look at the promises of God, it says something about God. But it also says something about how he feels about you. I want you to think about the promises of God. God says that I am a healer, and I want to give you the healing. Come on, somebody. God says I am love, and I want to give you love. Come on, somebody. God says I am power. He says he will renew your strength, and you will mount up with wings like eagles. God's promises say something about him, but it also says something about how he feels about you. And you're not worthy. Yeah. 